All right, everybody, I want to welcome you tonight. I appreciate everybody showing up, participating in this. I'm super excited. Um, I know I know this is going to be a blessing to you guys, um, having this guest on here. Uh, I have followed her for a while. I was just telling her and actually have read her book. And you know I don't put out uh, endorsements or reviews lightly. I'm very uh, selective about that. But if you go to her book on Amazon, you can actually see a review I left uh, because I was I was telling her earlier I was really um, always liked the content she put out but when I read the book I was like wow this is somebody who really gets it and to try to make a I, I know this will probably be a long long uh, introduction but how many of you are familiar by show of hands with like UFC MMA any of that stuff you guys watch that so I'm an old head, right? So I started watching this like in the 90s. And in the 90s, you guys, it was karate versus jujitsu. It was boxing versus Muay Thai, right? You had these different styles. And as we progressed a decade later, we had these guys that Chuck Liddell and these guys that learned to stop takedowns, but they were still strikers. Then it evolved in what we call today mixed martial arts because you had to be able to do everything. You had to be able to grapple, you had to be able to wrestle, you had to be able to box, you had to be able to kickbox. And, and you watched over 30 years this evolution of, of these, these fighters, these artists, they had to learn to do everything. And what I'm starting to see in the music industry is kind of the same thing, right? We went from the record labels and you were, you were, you were pigeonholed into to one way of doing business. But now we're starting to see these standout people uh, like Russ is a prime example that everybody probably knows, right? So Russ mixes his own stuff. He writes his own stuff. He does his own beats. He did his own marketing, distributed his own music. So he's, he's an MMA fighter. He's a mixed martial arts fighter. He's not locked into doing one thing. And I think that's kind of where we're going as an industry is you've got to be able to pretty much do it all. You've got to know a little bit about the legal aspects of it. If you don't want to get taken advantage of, you got to have a keen business sense and recognize opportunities and recognize scams. You got to, you got to be able to know how to market. Uh, you got to understand what a brand is, how to create a business plan. Um, and, and you, and, and it, you can save money if you learn how to do some video editing, filming, audio engineering, any of that stuff. Right. So we've, we're kind of evolving into these artists that really are going to have to be able to do it all. Um, or at least a little bit of everything or have some knowledge about it, which, which I think is an awesome thing. So I said all that in the long intro to say this. After watching her content and then reading her book, um, I was like, wow, this is one of those people that I have expected to come along in the industry that really has a grasp on the overall arc of everything, can really do it all. Uh, what she wrote, obviously, about the legal aspect. I don't want to pigeonhole her in you guys thinking she's just an attorney. Um, super smart at marketing, at branding, at building a team, at building your Instagram, um, uh, all that stuff. And so I was very impressed with that. I think she's years ahead of her time. And I think what you're going to see is these 10, 11, 12, 13, 14-year-old kids that grew up on Russ a couple years ago and artists like her. And they're just going to think it's normal to do it all. So as they become 17, 18, 19, 20, 24, we're going to see this more as a pattern of guys and gals being able to do everything um, in-house. So if you don't mind, Chris, so I hope that wasn't uh, too off base. That's how I perceive you. But you take a minute, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, your business, and your brand. Yeah, you got it. And I'll say, I mean, that was the perfect – synthesis of everything that I do, right? So I am an entertainment attorney. Um, my background is I've been doing music since I was four years old. I'm classically trained. And so, you know, I played cello and violin. I learned singing and then progressed to other instruments. And I just found that when I was in my young teens, I was performing in my family band. And so we did this like classical crossover thing like Lindsey Sterling, but there was three of us because it was a family band and we we're all, you know, roughly the same size. And my family was nice enough to allow me to perform for a segment during our shows. And so that's when I found myself as Miss Crystal. And I'm like, God, I really like performing. Fuck this classical music stuff. <laughs> um, so that's where I started to perform and find my own 
voice. And then over the, really the following decade, it was just kind of this, this rude awakening that happened because even at that time, that was the era of, you know, still Britney Spears and the Christina Aguilera's where you got discovered. And I think that a lot of musicians still have this idea and this notion that we're going to get discovered. Someone is going to believe in us. They're going to have the tools that we need to be able to understand marketing, to get us, you know, in front of the right audience, to get us in front of the right executives. That wasn't really true even then, but record labels were doing that. They were picking up these artists and they're like, okay, we're going to make you this thing. We're going to make you this product. That's not what it is anymore. What record labels are doing, because I do, you know, deals all day long from the small labels to the major labels. And what I can tell you is that they're looking for artists who already have their shit together, who already have the following, who are already hustling and essentially are their own businesses because the label now doesn't want to make that invest investment. It is a risk. It is a gamble. And so the label is looking for someone who or has already built something that they can essentially just take and now kind of run with it and put a little marketing into it and put a little team into it. So as you guys are thinking about your own careers, what you're doing, music, and the content is king, right? I'm a musician. That's what I make. That's what I do. But a lot of us haven't made that connection yet of understanding that music and your art is just as much a business as if you said, Crystal, I want to start a construction company. Crystal, I want to start, you know, a, a swimming class, you know, for, for kids or something like that whatever it is that you were doing, you would just still have to sit down and put together a strategy behind, all right, here's the thing that I'm trying to sell, AKA the music, and how am I gonna sell it? It's through the marketing. And so now you need to become a master marketer. Even if you end up bringing someone onto your team because they know the Instagram, they know TikTok, well, great, but there should never be someone who knows more shit than you. And that's because people will rotate and circulate in and out of your camp. It's just how it goes. People get so excited. They're like, oh man, you're doing something that's hot. I love your music. You're cool. And they'll get involved, but then they lose interest because guess what? It's hard work. And so um, you essentially need to learn and grow with your team, bring people in, but always be on top of everything. And, you know, I even say this to my artists that come to me because they'll have big record labels offering them deals. So exciting. Universal wants to give me $100,000. That's great. I still give the exact same advice to all my musicians. Stop giving your stuff away. Stop pretending like someone is going to care more about your music career than you. They won't. And even if you luck out to have an A&R rep who's excited about you, what happens is that those A&R people rotate out of the label. And so you get signed and then all of a sudden your dude that was there and had your back is no longer at the label. So even if you're independent, even if you're signed, it's the same mentality. You are your own worst enemy. You got to get up and you got to take on the responsibility that you have to be in charge of every aspect. And so that's why I put out the book. That's why and we'll, we'll get into, you know, I have a YouTube channel to help you guys to understand these different aspects, because even with the legal stuff, most people are like, you know, I'm not going to think about law or copyright or trademark. What are you talking about? But for me, I went to law school. Here's the funny thing. I went to law school because I wanted to be able to think like an attorney because I'm a musician. I wanted to be able to represent myself in my own career and to never be taken advantage of. Now, when I got out of law school, I was like, well, I have a law degree. Maybe I can help some people. And so I started an entertainment practice, but I'm still first and foremost a musician. And so now really what I'm trying to do is help you guys to think like an attorney. If you got a contract, if someone's trying to sell you and trying to be real slick and you're going to get this, you're going to get that, they're going to make you a big star that you can kind of see through the bullshit and be your own boss, be your own business person. And that's essentially my progression. I found all that out the very most difficult way you can think of through trial and error, every mistake that you can make, I've been through it. And so what I'm trying to do for you guys through the content that I release, just cut to the chase. I just wanna give you the tools that you need to be able to excel in your careers because even with all the best tools, you are still going up against so much as far as finding the funding, trying to you know make time for everything, because most of us have a hard time making money from our music to pay for our music, right? So some of the best 
revenue streams are usually touring merchandise. Who's buying merch right now? Who's touring right now? It's incredibly difficult. So for all those reasons, it's finding balance, finding your groove, but first and foremost, before you do anything else, setting your psychology, setting your mental state to, to have that determination that you're not going to rely on anybody else. And that's a scary thing. That is a very scary thing. And I've had multiple times throughout my career where I'm like, oh, you know, 18 years old, oh, I have to learn how to produce. I'm not trying to be a producer, but no one would fucking work with me. So I learned production and I put out my first album. And then you start finding people like, oh my gosh, Miss Crystal, I love what you're doing. And you start drawing people in. That's when you have to be a good leader. That's when you have to vet your, your team members. So we'll talk about a lot of things. I want to get to your guys' questions because, um, you know, there's nothing more important than what you're thinking about right now, what you need help with right now. And, um, and that's really the, the value that you're going to get out of this. Yeah, I, and I've, I've been driving this point home over and over. My guys that are in here from the community will tell you this. Um, the, the focus on the, my, on the business aspect is so hard to get artists to do. They're so caught up in making the music. But it's really what's going to set them apart. And I agree what you're saying. Record labels are looking for the already established person. Um, we had Mark Berry on here, and the way he put it was he's, they're looking for people already on the 50-yard line. Um, they're already halfway there. They've, they've already got a fan base. They've already got some money coming in. Just like a startup company, they are nothing more than venture capitalists. They come in and they say, hey, we've got extra money to inject into your thing. We have connections with DJs and other artists for collaborations, all these things, and, and media and PR groups. And we can take what you've built and scale it. But if you haven't built anything, if you don't have a business that's generating anything, um, then you're not going to have that record label coming and, and knocking. Um, it's just not how it works. And well, and it's also a standpoint of negotiation power. Because remember, the, the record label is not this magical creature on the other side of the, of the tunnel and there's the light and they're going to make all your dreams come true. That's not what it is. They're coming as a business partner to say, this is what we can do for you. In exchange, we're going to own you. We're yeah. going to own your music. And so it better be a good exchange. And so if you, if you're like, great, I still want to do the big label thing. Cool. I don't want to do the independent artist thing. Totally fine. But you need to be able to come to the table and be like, these are my numbers. This is my clout. These are my sales. And, you know, because you're never going to sit down and be like, please give me something. It's no. What are you going to do for me? Do you know uh, maybe what an industry standard for the numbers are? So, for example, I know in Amazon, if I build an Amazon store right now selling a product, a private label product I developed, it's usually about a four to one. So if I have a $250,000 a year revenue I can show, I can probably sell that company for a million dollars. Um, do you have any idea, do they use a formula like that as far as negotiating record deals? It's not, it's not a formula, but obviously, you know, the bigger the numbers, the better. Um, but, it, but it really has to do with the engagement of your fans, right? So just because you have, let's say, a million plays, or in, in the case of one of my independent musicians, he kind of lucked out. He had a song that just went insanely viral. It's now at like 50 million plays on Spotify, independent musician. He did this in his bedroom. Um, and then, of course, you know, he starts getting the attention of the big labels for the numbers alone. He, didn't, he doesn't necessarily have his team in place. He doesn't necessarily have anything kind of working at that moment. But just because of the numbers, it got a little juice. And then I have another artist who had a lot of smaller numbers, but because his fans are just going so crazy for him, it got the label's attention. So, you know, and even uh, what, Bad Baby, you know what I'm saying? There's these people, these artists who get a little buzz going for whatever reason. And just remember that, right? What is it that sets you apart that's going to make you stand out from the crowd? It's not necessarily always numbers. Because, you know what, quite frankly, numbers can be faked. And, and the marketing aspect, I just want to drive that point home. Um, let me mute here. Uh, just because, I, okay, for example, I've sold tens of thousands of t-shirts online. I'm not a graphic designer and I don't do retail, okay? I've had a couple number one books and sub niches on Amazon. I'm a horrible writer. Um, I, I've done all kinds of things online like that um, because of marketing. And, and it, 
you mentioned, I can't remember if it was before the call or since we got on the call. Yeah, you, in the era of Britney Spears, let's be honest, right? There, we know a lot of people that got put on by record labels that can't sing, um, but they were packaged and marketed right. They, they developed a brand and identity and worked with some great people who made them sound better than they actually do. But I can't emphasize enough how important you get in a grasp on brand and marketing is. But, and also just to expand on this, right? So, you know, you, you, can, you can testify to the fact that it's, it's work on your branding, work on your marketing so people can easily identify your voice, your look, what makes you unique. Um, but it's, it's to build that, that database of people who know and follow you. There is nothing that's more powerful than having people who support you. And so that's also a huge piece that's missed with a lot of musicians. They don't invest in their fans because they're like, oh, great, I had 20 comments today or 20 likes. Who the fuck cares? Like, I'm not going to respond to those people, whatever. Like, I appreciate them. But they don't think to, to every single comment respond, every single person, like how important that is in the beginning. And then when you get to the first hundred and then you get to the first thousand and having that culture of just, I live for my fans because they live for me. Your fans are the ones that will propel your success. And that's missed a lot. If, if some of you guys are new, uh, as far as interacting with me, Kevin Kelly, thousand true fans, write that down. You talk about fan engagement and really how to build a fan get, uh, base. You don't need millions of people. You don't need superstardom to eat off of your off of your music and your craft. I recommend highly that book. I want to stay on this topic, Ms. Crystal, because I think it's great. Um, branding. So what to you does it mean to be on brand? And, and do you have one or two suggestions to help young artists figure out how to find their brand, their voice, their identity, and connect with fans on that level. Being on brand means that you're being authentic. So, so when you sit down, you go, okay, what's my brand? Well, see, it's actually not just music, right? So if you have interests that are outside of music, for me, I'm a vegan, I love health and wellness, I love sharing things because I've just been, you know, dealing with so much my entire life. And so it's this nerdy side of me that, I will show to my fans, not all the time. So on my Miss Crystal platforms, I'm talking about music. I'm talking about what I'm doing, my personal life. But then there'll be a day, Wellness Wednesday, where I say, hey guys, today we're talking about vitamins, you know, and, and that doesn't appeal to everyone, but it does to some people. So as you're thinking about your brand, you think, okay, besides music, my niche, my style, my clothing, my look, my hair, what else makes you you? And if you can kind of pull out things, you know, you paint, you like to read, I crochet. It's like the nerdiest grandma thing I could possibly do. I love to crochet, you know? So there are things that people will remember for you. And, and so also to your second point, make sure you actually start testing that. Test it with your audience and to see, you know, what you're willing to share, what they respond to. And over time, you'll just fall into what feels the best. Because I'll tell you what, your fans and, and people who even just follow you because they're like secret haters, <laughs> all your followers who are paying attention to you, um, they're going to know and be able to call bullshit if you're front. If you're not like a real blingy kind of person and then you're all about the chains and, and all this stuff, like just be your authentic self, even if that means you're a huge nerd and you crochet. Travis, you must crochet. I saw you get excited when she mentioned crocheting. So. <laughs> um, an exercise that I always give everybody is if, if I've walked you into a party with 50 people, 100 people in there, and you weren't allowed to talk about music, who are you going to find and connect with? What are you going to connect on? So, and it, try, how can you bring that into your music? So I mentioned earlier MMA. I'm a big MMA fan, been there since the beginning. So if in my music video, I wear a Hoist Gracie shirt, you don't know who Hoist Gracie is unless you're a diehard MMA fan who's been there from the beginning. But those who do will connect with me on that level. Um, I've got one artist I work with who was a foster kid. I'm like, why don't you talk about that? You'll connect with other foster kids. You could build your thousand true fans just off foster kids. I guarantee it would be easy. Um, so yeah, finding those niches outside of music to help, especially that beginning fan base, I think is so important to play with and test out. 
Yeah, and I think it's kind of a combination of going deep and wide. What I mean by that is you want to go wide with your marketing, go to cold audiences, constantly be trying to reach new people with the music through all these different tactics that, you know, you can find or we'll talk about um, uh, on the Zoom call. But then you go deep. You go deep because you'll offer, like in my case, once a week, I'm going to talk about health. I'm going to talk about shit I've struggled with in my life. I'm going to talk about mental health. Um, that's something important to me, but I'm not posting that every day of the week. So, so, you know, go deep with the people that follow you, they'll care, but then obviously go wide with just the reach of, of what you're trying to do to get exposure for your music. Okay. There's no way I'm going to get through all my questions because I want to create time for everybody else, but I got probably two more that I definitely want to, three more that I want to touch on for sure. Um, copyright. So copyright a song. You hear all kinds of things, right? If if I mail it or email it to myself or my partner, it's protected. The minute I put it down, it's protected. Then you hear the other side, no, you need to formally register and copyright it, right? So my question to you is because of this, you know, I've got artists, I've got a couple artists right now that might have 10 or 20 songs up already that aren't producing any money for them. Um, they're still figuring out their sound, right? They're evolving as an artist. First, just like all of us, the first five, 10 songs we might go back and listen to and cringe um, that we ever put that out. But should they be spending money copywriting those things? Or is there another way to protect them? The answer is yes. The, what you're referring to is what's called the poor man's copyright. So the idea was that you mail something and then it's time stamped by, you know, when it was mailed and that kind of thing. Total BS. Don't ever listen to that again. <laughs> the poor man's copyright is just filing your copyright registration. And what I mean by that is um, when you file a copyright registration, it goes through the Library of Congress, which is just, you know, a glorified way of just saying, uh, you know, the copyright office. Um, so you file your copyright registration. Now it's $65, but the thing is that you can do it in bulk. You can do it for your EP, your album. So, so you know, if you want to kind of, you know, pinch pennies or whatever, wait to do it when you have a collection of work, but do it. And here's, and here's the reason why. Under copyright law, as soon as you make your music, your lyrics, as soon as you put a intangible, right, so then a thought into a tangible, a written note, an mp3 that you recorded on your phone as soon as you make something into a tangible it's automatically protected by copyright law you are the copyright owner of that lyric of that mp3 the reason we take the additional step to register with the copyright office is because it's a prerequisite for you filing a lawsuit to enforce your rights so you want to do it because there's this huge delay with the copyright office they're so backed up and so you file and you won't actually get the registration for like nine months and so making it part of your business practice is so that if, if Travis Scott comes and rips off your guitar loop, current lawsuit going on, then you can file a lawsuit to say he should have paid me for that guitar riff. Um, so, so those are the reasons why you want to do it just as a general business practice if you have to enforce your rights at some point down the road. But just know that under copyright law, as soon as you make the thing, you have copyright protection. So could I hypothetically create my EP, copyright it, send it off, release one song a month from that 10 song EP, and then the time my copyright comes back, happy year later, um, I'm protected? Yeah, you got it. Um, and, and as far as the, the time of registration, think of the copyright office as a glorified file keeper. So if I was your, you know, your, your file keeper and you send it to me, you go, you know, Miss Crystal, when you, when you get this, I just need you to make sure to timestamp in, let me know, you know, everything's okay, send me a piece of paper. That's all the Library of Congress is doing. They're not looking and examining and being like, is this really copyrighted? They literally just register it and send you a piece of paper. Okay. Um, and then, the I saw I can't remember if I read it I think I read it in your book that you had one sync deal where you had a song that was placed in a TV show and a club scene or something like that you also in your book listed some sync companies so I was just curious about how your sync deal came about that's a topic I'm really curious about right now um, sync deals and did you use one of those companies? Did it happen another way? And what would you recommend for people like me that are looking to get into that? 
Yeah, you got it. So what we're talking about, guys, is um, when you sync, it's it's literally you sync music to TV or film. So it's like a motion picture or it's in a TV show. Um, so so for the sync deals, there's different ways that you can get them, right? So one that I talked about in the book has to do with libraries. And so that would be like a Jingle Punks, for example. And I give a little list. But you go through these libraries and you sign your music up and you say, hey, I want my music to be in your library because because a movie producer or a music supervisor will sign up for these libraries and be like okay i need a sad song female vocal acoustic guitar and they'll do a search and based on those keywords they'll hopefully find your song and then you get a split um between jingle punks and you know that's one way you can get music placed my objection to that even though i've done it and i have had some success from the past is that you have so much competition you are just fighting against hundreds of thousands, if not millions of other wonderful, you know, songs and things like that that have been registered. Um, so there are different libraries out there. I'm not saying don't pursue them, but just understand that there's a lot of competition. And some of these libraries um, will ask for exclusive rights. When I say exclusive, I, I mean they want to be able to have the music only. Okay, if it's non-exclusive, you can put it in this library, you can put it in that library. When they tie up your music, you're, you're putting all your eggs in one basket and you're hoping that they're going to, you know, magically connect you to the right people and you'll get paid and this and that. And it just might not ever happen. So just be cautious. If you do want to do music libraries, my suggestion just would be make sure the contract that you sign with that company is non-exclusive so you can take your music and do other things with it. Um, now, now one other thing that I just want to note on, that's my not so preferred route of getting sync placements. The new one, and I shouldn't say new, the one that I have been focused on the most in the last year is through my own efforts. This goes back to doing yourself, right? And this has to do with finding music supervisors, okay? That's a very important dis distinction to even write down. A music supervisor is the person who will say, okay, I have you know, Vampire Diaries, episode whatever, this is the type of music that I need. And so they will typically look at music in their catalog and they'll hopefully have you in mind. So for example, I really try to brand my niche as dark pop, okay? So it's like Prodigy meets, you know, Poppy meets some kind of more mainstream pop thing. It's a very unique sound. And so what I'm trying to do is that as I'm connecting with music supervisors and making friends, because you got to do that. You can't just spam people. If you just spam them, just send oh. them a link. They will blacklist you. They will remember your name, but for the wrong reason. Um, but, but, you know, through that process, uh, because I'm branding it, they'll think when those things come up, those dark shows come up, well, Miss Crystal's a good fit for us. So that's, that's a more long game kind of approach it takes more time it takes more effort but you know as you're building your music career and your team it's well worth it that you have those actual relationships because the only difference the only difference of what happens if a label is doing that for you is that the label is emailing the music supervisors hey you should check this out well the label has the relationships not you so that's why it's a pain in the ass but i promise this is a good investment of your time to actually make friends yourself yeah, so on that note, to elaborate, guys, just to drive that point home, you can watch your favorite Netflix show, your movies, your series, all that stuff, and they show music supervisors credited at the end, right? You can get names. You can find them on, on LinkedIn. Don't knock LinkedIn. But what she's saying is don't spam. Go and befriend these people, offer something to them, build a relationship, and then out of curiosity, They'll remember you or start to look at your stuff as you develop a relationship. I can, and I'm nobody, you know, other, I just do these courses and, and a little bit of A&R work uh, for Sony AMG, but I get constant DMs, let's work, or here's the link to my song. I've got one guy right now, I can open up my phone and show you. He has sent me 50 links um, to, to Spotify and, and YouTube. I've never opened a one, not a one. But the guys who have reached out and said, man, I really appreciate what you do. I really appreciate the game you spit. You're really helping us. And then what's, a, what's going on with this? And then I respond. And then we start a conversation. Then when they hit me up, 
and and there's no hidden agenda. It's just reciprocity. They hit me up. I see they've been sharing my stuff, commenting and tagging me. And then they're like, hey, could you share this? Yeah, man, I got you. I'll take care of you. Or I'll listen to your stuff and give you some feedback. We're in this together. We're invested. We've got a relationship. Um, but man, get off that lazy, just, just spam and stuff. Nobody, if you're not going to get nothing. Well, and let me, let me also just plant these two seeds, right? So the reason why pursuing sync is so useful is twofold. One has to do with money. If you can get a placement in a commercial or in a real life feature film, I mean, we're talking about real money. We're talking about like $50,000, $100,000, and then exposure. There are artists that have made entire careers because they had one song that was in a big movie. So it's worth the investment because the payoff is so huge, literally and figuratively. Um, and then the second piece is that it's, it's, it goes to the marketing point, right? So we'll talk about if a label is going to dump, you know, a uh, hundred thousand dollars into marketing their artists. Well, if you can do that for yourself, because you had a song placed in one of these TV shows or film, it's going to double dip. So um, be patient, but also try to reverse engineer. Something that I found helpful is I'll take a look and I'll search like, uh, you know, you can find upcoming shows that are in process, or you can be like, I really loved that Vampire Diaries. So you just do a quick Google search who was the music supervisor on that because i'll tell you what a lot of these guys end up doing a lot of similar shows and so you know you make friends with bob who does the dark pop stuff well he'll hopefully keep you in mind when he has other shows that he's working on so it's it's incredibly relationship specific yeah great point on the finances too if, if you guys go to the youtube channel and watch the interview with mark berry he did a publishing split with somebody an artist of his in the 90s and he was talking about he just like the week we did the interview, he just opened up another check from that publishing deal that was in a TV show for like 2,500 bucks. They've been coming for like 30 years because they've taken the syndicated show and now they're showing it in Brazil and in Japan and different places around the world. And the checks have been coming for decades. So yeah, that's yeah. really powerful. And if I can just give you guys a resource, because I know for some of you that haven't really, you know, put a toe in the water with this yet, it can feel incredibly overwhelming. It's a lot of information. We're talking about like having to cold call people, like it all kind of sucks balls. <laughs> but a good resource is there's a company called What Up Pitches. So What Up, P-I-T-C-H-E-S. And What Up Pitches has started to do these, these um, almost weekly um, live streams with music supervisors and so they're literally introducing you guys to these different supervisors and then if you want them to actually listen to your music to be considered um, I've, I've watched these live streams where the, the supervisors will be like that's great I'm gonna add that to my catalog because they heard it during that live stream so that's a good place to start just start listening just start watching um, and then you can kind of ease into it that way last question for me and we'll keep it under a few minutes. Um, how important is mindset? Mindset's everything. I'll tell you what, just if you don't feel like you want to do something and you don't have some kind of strategy to overcome your lack of motivation, you're not doing shit that day. So, so having an ability to have a clear mindset and a clear motivation, even when you don't feel like it, is the kind of the do or die. That's going to set you apart from everybody else. Because I promise we all go through the same feeling down on ourselves, feeling down on our music, feeling down on our careers because of whatever reason or excuse we're thinking of. So kind of going through your, your self therapies, whatever that is to deal with your internal negativity as well as the external negativity is probably one of the most paramount things you can do. I mean, there's a reason why the biggest rock stars in the world are heroes, are killing themselves because <laughs> yeah. they just never were able to develop coping skills. So you know, don't let that happen to you. Mindset's incredibly important. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of my biggest things. And if you guys saw my post on Instagram about Russ, I'm not a huge fan of his music, but he won me over with the mindset game. And I even bought his, his book on mindset. And it's simple, but it's so awesome. I really challenge you guys to get it and read it. Uh, it's very cool. A lot of law of attraction kind of stuff and all that, but I loved it. Well, and if I could just offer a resource, um, yeah, so, so if, it's, if it's helpful for anyone who's maybe like kind of struggling right now with anything, um, for me, one of the best things I've ever read in my life was um, Awaken the Giant by Tony Robbins. Um, it's, it's, it's from forever ago at this point, but it was so paramount for, paramount for me to kind of 
figure out coping skills for all the negativity and the stress. Like I was really drowning with a lot of things um, when I was in law school, I was putting out my first record. Um, it was a lot, but he goes through and he teaches you coping skills, how to reframe things because you got to change how you react because it's constant, constant issues and stressors. And so if you don't change how you're able to control your reaction to the external crap, um, you'll drown in it every single time. Yep. I, and I love that book too. Uh, read it several times. So yeah. every question that you guys have, we'll move into your questions now. I guarantee you that on her YouTube channel or in her book, she has probably answered. Um, so I highly recommend that you, you check out the YouTube channel. You get the book. If you've, this has been, this has been free for you guys. And if you found any value in this, the, the honorable thing to do, in my opinion, would be to go get this book and to leave it a great review and to sow that out in the universe uh, as a way of payment. Uh, tell us a little bit about your, before we open up the questions, about your YouTube channel. Okay. In any case, guys, so I just want to tell you about the new channel. It's called Top Music Attorney. And um, we formally started this because I was releasing all of these videos on my channel for Miss Crystal. And just because, you know, I released my music there, I just... I didn't want the cross pollination. So I started the new channel because it's 100% dedicated to you guys. Everything we release on that channel has to do with music education, music news, law, um, marketing tips. I mean, you know, Scott was talking about how my book is really the A to Z on having a, a successful music career. So what I do is I break it down kind of piece by piece through the YouTube channel. So definitely check it out. Tons of free content. and. Uh, you know, for example, the last video we released, it's all about how do you break a music contract? How do you get out of a music contract? So this is the stuff that, you know, uh, I, I tell my clients when we're, you know, trying to do all kinds of things. So definitely check it out. 